In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. In this lecture on St. Gregory of Nazianzus, we will be considering a collection of his homilies given uh, and preached on the occasion of various feasts of the Church. And therefore they have been gathered together uh, as a collection known as the Festal Orations. It might be helpful for us, uh, before we turn to some of the writings of St. Gregory, to consider again some aspects of his life. Uh, he was born in 329 AD, a few years after the first ecumenical council, which was held at Nicaea in 325. And he died in 390 AD, a few years after the second ecumenical council, which took place in the city of Constantinople in 381 AD. He was the son of Bishop Gregory of Nazianzus, and he came from a well-established and highly thought-of Christian family uh, in the region of Pontus in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. Uh, for much of his life he was a friend and sometimes a monastic with St Basil the Great. Uh, and under the influence of St Basil he was made Bishop of Sassima uh, to help support St Basil uh, in various controversies he was engaged with against those who held Arian views. Uh, Sassima, as we perhaps remember, was a very tiny hamlet, uh, little more than a staging post on the roads through the empire, and he was unable to enter into even the tiny village and take up his residency as bishop because he was opposed by the neighbouring bishop who claimed it uh, as part of his own jurisdiction. He was then sent to Constantinople to support and encourage the small Nicene minority which was struggling there uh, under an Arian majority. Uh, and then he found himself president of the second ecumenical council which was held in that city. There was some controversy about his position there since he had been consecrated as bishop of another town uh, even though he was unable to establish himself as bishop there. And so he withdrew from the council rather than cause uh, dispute. Uh, and he retired into solitude for a while. Uh, and then he found himself acting as Bishop of Nazianzus uh, after his father and then the succeeding bishop uh, had reposed. Uh, and it was there uh, that he ended his life uh, in retirement, um, gathering together many of his thoughts. Uh, in some of his writings. Uh, he was renowned for his rhetorical skills, which he had learned in Athens, Caesarea and Alexandria. Uh, he gained what we could say was the uh, highest levels of education according to the time. Uh, and he was uh, gifted with speech and with the ability to write, uh, not only in a clear way, but in a way that persuaded men according to the rhetorical skills of the time. And of course, St. Gregory of Nazianzus is one of that very small group of people whom the church uh, has given the title of theologian to. Uh, he is St. Gregory the theologian. Uh, before him, there is only St. John, the apostle, the evangelist and theologian. Uh, and after him, perhaps uh, we have to wait even into medieval times and outside of Oriental Orthodoxy to find uh, St. Simeon, the new theologian. Uh, the idea in the church of uh, being described as a theologian was one that was very rarely given uh, and not one that would, one would claim for uh, oneself. Uh, it was given as a mark not of uh, very great academic study but of a profound insight into the nature of God himself. In another lecture we have considered the five theological orations and these were part of a systematic response to Arianism, which St. Gregory of Nazianzus was combating at this time, together with uh, other Orthodox bishops. Uh, Arianism had developed since the time of Arius and after the Council of Nicaea. And we sometimes have the idea that uh, in 325 AD, Arianism was dealt with once and for all, uh, and it has no history after that point. In fact, it became... Uh, much more influential and much more powerful and dominant after the Council of Nicaea than before. Uh, it developed more uh, sophisticated ways of expressing similar ideas uh, than those which had first been propounded by Arius uh, and his own teachers. 
Uh, and it wasn't really until 381 AD and the Second Council of Constantinople that Arianism was dealt with once and for all. And in uh, these five orations, he challenges, first of all, uh, the idea that just anyone can engage in theological discussion. Uh, and he suggests even that it's harmful for uh, everyone to imagine it's simply a matter of having read a book or two and then being able to speak. Um, his second oration describes the elevated nature of theology. It's not something that just everyone can engage in. Um, and it's not even something that only educated people can engage in. It's, uh, it requires a, a spirituality and a purity of heart uh, to be able to speak of God. And in the third and fourth orations, he deals with some of these uh, errors which are prevalent in his time and which essentially uh, deny the divinity of the word of God in one way or another. Uh, and they make uh, the word to be like God, but not God himself, so that essentially he is not God at all. And then in his fifth oration, he deals with a problem that is be beginning to become pressing in his own times. Uh, and St. Basil writes about this also in a collection of writings on the Holy Spirit. Uh, this idea that even if we accept that uh, the word is God, um, we should still suggest that the Holy Spirit is not God at all in the same way. Uh, and so in a sense, Arianism rolls over into this controversy uh, about the Holy Spirit. And we see this in the fifth theological oration, that it's uh, already uh, an issue which the church has to deal with. Uh, in these festal orations, which we are going to consider in this lecture, there is a different aim. Uh, many of the feasts are just being established in the fourth century. The Feast of the Nativity, for instance, was relatively new at the time that Gregory of Nazianzus is writing. Uh, it was introduced in the fourth century into Constantinople from Rome, where it was first. Uh, celebrated separately from the Epiphany. Uh, and, and after being celebrated in a half-hearted way, there were many decades where it was uh, ignored altogether in Constantinople before being taken up again. Um, and it was a similar experience in Antioch and Alexandria. Uh, it took a little while for the Feast of the Nativity to be established. Uh, and so in these festal orations, uh, we have a window into this period when some of these feasts were just being established and when the whole idea of a Christian calendar and a Christian year uh, was being thought about. Um, the calendar was being transformed from uh, one which had very, very local commemorations of important martyrs. We remember, for instance, um, in the life of St. Polycarp, that it says at the end of it, when he had been martyred and, and his holy relics had been gathered up, that the church in Smyrna gathered every year to celebrate the anniversary of his martyrdom. Uh, these sorts of very local celebrations were not universal by any means. Uh, and even the major feasts of the church were still really restricted to uh, the Feast of Pascha, uh, which was still undergoing some controversy itself. Uh, and at the beginning of the year, or our year in January, uh, the combined feast of, of Epiphany, Theophany, uh, and Nativity. So there were really only very few established and settled feasts in the church in the 4th century, and the calendar was only slowly being transformed. And also, as we see in these festal orations, two important words that we will examine as we go through some of the texts. One is anamnesis which uh, means a remembrance, uh, a bringing to mind um, of the events that are being considered. And we'll think about that in just a minute. And the other word is mimesis. Uh, and in English, we have the word mimic that comes from the same root. The idea of copying or imitating what we are reading about. And these two ideas are present in the festal orations, that we are in some way, as we will consider, entering into these events uh, and in another sense that we are to imitate the lives of those about whom we read. Uh, these are important aspects in the festal orations, uh, as we shall see. Uh, we will also see that the orations are addressed to real congregations of people. Uh, they are, are not theological texts to be written down and distributed in a written form. 
these are the homilies that were uh, presented perhaps written beforehand maybe given extempore uh, but they were given by St Gregory to the congregations who gathered on the occasions of these feasts uh, and he speaks to them as ordinary people gathered together uh, and, and the whole of these texts are well worth reading they're very beautiful uh, and they're filled with both theological and spiritual insight as I hope we can see as we consider uh, just a few excerpts from these orations uh, if we turn first of all just for a moment to the word anamnesis and, and this is a, a quotation from the introductory essay by the translator uh, of these homilies that I'm using Nonna Werner Harrison and she says this about anamnesis anamnesis is historical but is not primarily looking back to the past festal celebration is not nostalgia it is not a commemoration of what once took place Anamnesis is an encounter in the present with the Lord who transfigures and transcends history. And thus it is also a prophetic anticipation of the age to come. The historical events in which God has acted can be present now and in the future. And so when we think of anamnesis, and we can imagine it ourselves in our own celebrations of the feasts, uh, especially perhaps the feast of Pascha, uh, we are not thinking only of what happened 2,000 years ago, but rather we are entering into those events as living events which have a, a cosmic resonance through the ages. Uh, we are not recreating them as if uh, putting on some sort of drama uh, that makes it appear that we are living those events but we are truly entering into those events as we encounter the Lord Jesus Christ our God who was present there and is present with us and will be present in the future in the fullness of the experience of these feasts uh, and so anamnesis is about a participation our participation in the nativity not just our commemoration of it our participation in Pascha, our participation in Palm Sunday, our participation in Pentecost. Uh, it is something that requires us to be drawn into the reality, the living experience of these events, uh, rather than looking backwards uh, as if we were outsiders or, or recreating them as if disconnected. Uh, rather, anamnesis means our participation in the present of that reality which was in the past is now and will be in the future and the other word mimesis um, Nonna Werner Harrison also describes this uh, and she is a, a well-known patristic scholar who has translated many of the works in the popular patristic series in such Christian mimesis what matters is not whether the exemplars begin as saints or sinners but where their stories end However, imitation of saints and of Christ remains central for Gregory. It is essential to note that he and his contemporaries have in mind the imitation of virtues. Imitation of the saints is ultimately imitation of Christ. Uh, and this is what this word mimesis means. And this is how Gregory of Nazianzus uh, uses it in a natural way in his orations. Is this idea that we should become like these figures that we read about uh, we should become like the Saints we should become like Christ uh, not as though uh, they were only examples that we follow at second hand but we should take on personally their qualities and their virtues uh, so that we live ourselves their own life just as anamnesis is to participate ourselves in the events as we will see mimesis is to become like these figures especially like christ uh, not in an external way but but within the heart uh, within the growth of character and of virtue um, so that they become not just a, a model for us but a, a living example in whose life we participate to some extent so these two ideas of anamnesis and mimesis we will see uh, as we begin to turn to passages from these uh, festal orations and we should have them in mind 
a couple of other things that we should uh, think of before we turn to the texts themselves. Uh, in the Byzantine Eastern Orthodox tradition, uh, a larger collection of 16 of these homilies were often bound together uh, and were preached in churches and cathedrals on the appropriate feast days so that the knowledge of uh, the teaching and expression of St. Gregory of Nazianzus was very widely spread in different cultures. Uh, his homilies were turned to. Uh, they formed the congregations who heard them over many centuries, not only when he gave them himself, uh, but through the Middle Ages uh, and even into modern times. Uh, and secondly, because these are homilies which are given to congregations, there is always that sense that St. Gregory of Nazianzus is looking for a personal application in the lives of those who hear him. Uh, he is not interested only in um, theological and hypothetical um, content to his sermons and teachings. Uh, many times he says, uh, I, I've spoken enough theology. Now I need to speak about economy. I need to speak about the working out of things. Uh, because in the end, that's what's important to him in these homilies, that his congregations go away with a personal application of the things that he has spoken about. Uh, and now we'll turn uh, to these festal orations, and we have some excerpts from each of the ones in this particular volume. Uh, and this is the cover of the volume, Festal Orations, St. Gregory of Nazianzus. Uh, and within this volume are, are six orations or homilies uh, translated into uh, very accessible English with uh, a good collection of notes. Uh, and if you are able to acquire this, then you will see in the notes how often St. Gregory of Nazianzus uh, quotes from the scriptures or alludes to the scriptures uh, as he preaches. As is the case with many of the great fathers, they are almost always expounding the scriptures. They are not presenting interesting ideas just for their own sake. They want their congregations to come uh, into a closer connection with the scriptures and to have a better understanding of the scriptures. And this volume is published in the popular patristic series uh, that we have been following throughout these lectures on the Cappadocians. So let's begin with uh, an excerpt from Oration 1 on Pascha. And he says this, Yesterday the lamb was slaughtered, and the doorposts were anointed, and the Egyptians lamented the firstborn, and the destroyer passed over us, and the seal was awesome and venerable, and we were walled in by the precious blood. Today we have totally escaped Egypt and Pharaoh the harsh despot, and the burdensome overseers, and nobody hinders us from celebrating a feast of exodus for the Lord our God. Now here we can see uh, what we mean by anamnesis because he's immediately placing the experience of his congregation and himself into the context of things which happened thousands of years ago. It was not yesterday that the lamb was slaughtered. It was 3,500 years ago that the lamb was slaughtered and the doorposts were anointed. But using the idea of anamnesis, it happened yesterday on Good Friday. Uh, and here we see that he is linking the events of the life of our Lord Jesus in reality with the type or the figure which occurred in the Old Testament. But then he's uniting both of these ideas with the present experience of his congregation and of himself. As far as we are concerned, he says, it was yesterday that the lamb was slaughtered. It was yesterday the lamb was slaughtered in Egypt. It was yesterday the lamb of God was slaughtered in Jerusalem. It was yesterday that we participated in all of these things as we gathered together in the temple, in the church, uh, and offered prayers and praises to God. Uh, and so we have a personal encounter with these things, he's saying. We're not gathering together just to remember them uh, and think how inspiring they are. We're not gathering together just to uh, recognize how cleverly we can see the types uh, and the symbols. Uh, we are gathering together because we are present in both of these events. Uh, and they are experiences we are having now. Uh, we are standing together uh, around the table as we consume 
uh, the Passover lamb. We are gathered around the table uh, as the lamb of God is slaughtered. Uh, and we are gathered together in our church, uh, celebrating our Paschal prayers and praises. And these are the same thing. These are the same experience. Uh, and as we give ourselves to God, uh, and, and as we raise ourselves into a spiritual frame of life and of thought, uh, we begin to see that these are the same event. And we also were those gathered around the Paschal table in our homes uh, as the, la the blood of the Lamb of Sacrifice was painted on the door. Uh, and we also are those who are gathered in our churches on the Paschal Eve. Uh, and if we like, the blood of Christ, the Lamb of God, is, is painted on the door of the church. Uh, and we are preserved overnight as we pray, as uh, the Israelites under Moses were preserved when they were obedient. And today, he says, today we have totally escaped Egypt and Pharaoh. Uh, the reality of what happened uh, under Moses in the past centuries and millennia, it is an experience that we also are able to participate in. Uh, the, the Egypt and the Pharaoh of which we speak are different, but the participation in that experience of liberation and of exodus is the same. Uh, and we, if we enter spiritually into the reality of this feast, we also will experience and participate in that same sense of liberation from slavery. Uh, which is what these past events looked forward to, which is what the events around the crucifixion and the death and the resurrection of Christ brought about, and which now in the present we are able to participate in and experience. And so here we see what anamnesis is. It's not a remembrance. Uh, nor are we dressing up to pretend that we are like Moses and the Israelites, or, or, or even like the disciples at the time of Jesus. We are truly entering into the spiritual meaning uh, of each of these types, each of these events in the life of Christ, and they have a profound meaning in our own lives uh, if we see them and participate in them uh, in the right way. And so he's speaking to his own congregation. No one is hindering us from celebrating a feast of Exodus. Uh, how do we celebrate the Feast of Exodus in our own reality? Uh, it is not by escaping from Egypt uh, and the slavery under Pharaoh. Uh, it is from escaping the slavery under Satan and the bondage to the kingdom of the world. But the experience and the participation is the same. The faith is the same. Um, the reality of the encounter with God who saves and preserves is the same. It is anamnesis, not nostalgia. Uh, it is anamnesis, a participation in the same event in the present. And we understand, following on from that, as, as it was explained to us, uh, that there's also a, a future aspect of it. Uh, there will be a freedom even in the future from all bondage to all darkness, to all sin, to all death, to all temptation. Uh, and this experience of, of the Exodus is the fulfillment of that which we already experience, that which was brought about in the life of Christ, and that which was prefigured in the typology of the Old Testament. And these are the same thing as we experience them ourselves and will experience them. Also from this first homily, first oration on Pascha, and we see here he's continuing the idea. Now he's moved from Moses and he's thinking especially of Christ and the things that happened uh, in his case 300 years before. In our case 2,000 years before. Yesterday I was crucified with Christ. Today I am glorified with him. Yesterday I died with him. Today I am made alive with him. Yesterday I was buried with him. Today I rise with him. But let us make an offering to the one who died and rose again for us. Let us offer our own selves, the possession most precious to God and closest to him. Let us give back to the image that which is according to the image. There are three things I see here. First of all, there is, again, this sense of anamnesis. 
uh, we are finding ourselves at, at the foot of the cross we are finding ourselves at the tomb um, we are finding ourselves eventually on, on the morning of the resurrection when the angels tell us that he is no longer here and he is risen there is an anamnesis here we are not thinking that 2000 years ago Christ died what does that mean for me we are thinking that yesterday I was crucified with Christ it happened yesterday as it happened in one sense every year as it happens in one sense every day but I participated yesterday in the crucifixion of Christ uh, and this is anamnesis it happened yesterday as far as my personal experience is concerned it is immediate to me uh, but here also we see this idea of mimesis I am to become like Christ and there's a very famous uh, medieval Catholic book called The Imitation of Christ by Thomas a Kempis which has this idea that we are to become imitators of Christ uh, how am I to be like Christ I must be crucified with him uh, this doesn't mean I must think about his crucifixion and, and understand uh, that I should be grateful it means that I which is within me must be put to death uh, yesterday i died with him today i am made alive with him what does this mean it means i must personally experience the life of christ within me if i am to become like him and imitate him i cannot imitate him without being with him without being in union with him because my imitation is not to be a counterfeit it is to be an exact representation of his life uh, and so uh, again with this sense of uh, us having something to do when he is preaching we have to offer our whole selves and as we offer our whole selves to Christ putting ourselves to death crucifying ourselves then we discover that that image of God in which we were made is reformed uh, as we give ourselves to Christ we become his imitation and how do we become his imitation we put on again that image and likeness of god which was stamped in us at the beginning but this requires that we give all of ourselves to god and this giving all of ourselves to god is this being crucified with christ it is this being dead with him so that we might rise with him and be glorified with him uh, and so we see here anamnesis our own encounter with God in these events and mimesis this idea that we are to become like Christ uh, and this idea that there is a personal application what are we to do we must give ourselves that which is our most personal and precious possession uh, we must give it to God because it is that one thing that most precious thing that he desires from us and having given ourselves to God uh, looking backwards and experiencing now ourselves the events of the holy week uh, and the resurrection weekend having done to ourselves what christ did for us we discover that this image of christ and of god is found in us uh, in a perfect mimesis not one that we bring about ourselves i am trying to be like jesus but one that takes place within us by the life and the grace of jesus christ which is within us and, and he continues this idea in this first oration let us become like Christ this is mimesis since Christ also became like us and then in powerful words let us become gods because of him since he also because of us became human he assumed what is worse that he might give what is better he became poor that we through his poverty might become rich he took the form of a slave that we might regain freedom he descended that we might be lifted up he died to save us he ascended to draw to himself those of us who lay below in the fall of sin we know that we find many of these ideas in the other fathers of the church these are not unusual words uh, but they are words we find uh, uh, in athanasius and cyril and severus and all the great fathers and gregory and basil that what christ gives us is his divine life and what he has received from us is our humanity in all of its weakness 
Uh, and of course, when we say that we are made gods, uh, even here in the translation, it has a small g. It doesn't ever mean that we become members of the Holy Trinity. It doesn't ever mean that we become uh, those who are divine in our essence. But it means that God desires us to be sharing his life as far as is possible for us. Uh, in a sense, we can say that we share the life of the sun as we stand in the sun and feel its heat uh, and see by its light. And we never become the sun or, or the moon at night can be so bright that we can read a book by it. But the moon is only ever reflecting the light and the glory of the sun. Uh, in the same way, God gives us this reflected and, and human experience of his life and his glory that we might become like him in every aspect of our being without ever ceasing to be human. Let us become like Christ, mimesis, since Christ also became like us. Uh, and then we have all of these things that God has done for us in Christ. Uh, and each one of them is intended to raise us from our fallen, broken, frail human state. Uh, to participate in the life and the glory of sons and daughters of God. Uh, it is always uh, an experience which is intended to change our character and our experience. Uh, it is never a matter of learning propositions. It is always a matter of participation in a life and in a relationship. Uh, I do not become rich simply because I read in a book that Christ has made me rich, but I become rich as I enter into a union with God in Christ who became poor for my sake. Uh, I do not experience life by reading in a book about life, but by entering into an experience and an encounter with God in Christ who is life and who bore my death for my salvation that I might bear his life. Uh, in all of these, we see this is what it is to become like Christ. Um, it, it's not something we're trying to do in our own strength. It's a participation and an encounter with the divine person of the word of God himself. Um, so that encountering him, we become like him. Uh, and this encounter with him is one which is rooted in the past, lived in the present uh, and has promise for the future which is anamnesis. Uh, let's jump ahead to oration 38, which is another of his festal orations. Uh, we, we have many homilies by, by St. Gregory of Nazianzus. And this one is on the nativity. Uh, and we can see on reading this, this homily uh, in its full extent that there was still uh, novelty about celebrating the feast of the nativity apart from the feast of uh, Epiphany. But again, we begin straight away with this sense of anamnesis, of participating in events which have already taken place, but which are made alive in the present for us. Again, the darkness is dissolved. Again, the light is established. Again, Egypt is punished by darkness. Again, Israel is illumined by a pillar. Let the people sitting in the darkness of ignorance see a great light of knowledge. The old things have passed. Behold, all things have become new. The letter withdraws. The spirit advances. The shadows have been surpassed. The truth has entered after them. What can we say here? We can see, first of all, that St. Gregory Nazianzus is going back to the time of Moses again uh, and the Exodus. Uh, and again, we are thinking here, uh, about when darkness was sent upon the face of the earth in Egypt as one of the plagues. Uh, and also that Israel, as it was led forth from uh, Egypt, was guided by a pillar of fire. And so in Anamnesis, we go back, back thousands of years uh, to the events surrounding the exodus and the liberation of the people of God. But once again, we are not thinking in terms of nostalgia. We are not thinking in terms of uh, how do we remember what happened then and try to apply them to ourselves. We are talking about a participation in a living experience today. The old things have passed. Behold, all things have become new. 
The letter withdraws, the spirit advances, the truth has entered after them. Uh, and so we have our own personal and, and corporate in the church experience of the exodus. We have our own personal experience of darkness being driven away by light. Uh, and we experience this in what Christ has done, who is the truth, where the experience of Moses was the shadow. But even when we come to think of Christ in anamnesis, we are not thinking only of what Christ did, but of how we enter into that now. Uh, and so at the Feast of the Nativity, we are thinking about how light has broken into our lives and our world. We are not thinking only about how light came 2,000 years before us uh, when Christ was incarnate. But we are thinking how we also still, day by day, and especially on the feasts, encounter this light of God in the darkness of our world. Uh, we are entering into a living participation uh, in the Feast of the Nativity. Uh, and in a sense, in the darkness of the world in which we live in the 21st century, the angels appear again with tidings of great joy for mankind. Uh, and we don't read only about uh, their message from 2000 years ago, but we hear it afresh uh, as though they appear in the skies above us now uh, as we participate in the Feast of the Nativity. Uh, hear what he says and this this suggests that we are at a period of flux because we wouldn't quite describe the feast of the nativity in this way now is the feast of the theophany and so also of the nativity for it is called both since two names are ascribed to one reality for god appeared to human beings through birth on the one hand he is and is eternally from the eternal being on the other hand, for us, he later comes into being, that the one who has given us being might also grant us well-being, or rather that he might bring us back again to himself through incarnation. The name is Theophany since he has appeared, and Nativity since he has been born. Uh, and so here we see that the calendar is still uh, being developed, uh, it's not entirely clear whether this homily is given on what we would call the Feast of the Nativity or whether it's given on the Feast of Theophany and, and it's starting to become the Feast of the Nativity, which then becomes separated in time. Uh, but what we see here uh, and what strikes me is the high quality of the theological understanding, which is expected of his congregation. We have heard all of us many homilies on the Feast of the Nativity. Uh, and often our homilies are filled with uh, moral instructions. Uh, sometimes they are filled with um, encouragements to praise God or give thanks to God. But in many of the fathers, when they are preaching to their congregations, uh, some of their homily will be filled with very... Uh, dense theological ideas, important theological ideas, uh, because it is important for each one of our congregation to have a solid foundation in their understanding of the dogma of the church. Uh, this doesn't mean that uh, each one needs to attend uh, particular classes on dogmatics. Uh, it doesn't mean that each one needs to have a, a, a detailed understanding of, of Greek terms and the history of various controversies. Uh, but here in this homily, even in passing, uh, we see that St. Gregory is insistent that, for instance, it is God who has appeared to human beings. That is why it's called theophany. Uh, and on the other hand, he also wants to be insistent that this one who has appeared is eternal. Uh, God the Word is eternal. It's not a man or a, a mere baby that has been born. It is the one who is eternally from eternal being. Uh, and yet we also see in just this one paragraph, he wants to express why the incarnation took place. Uh, it was so that God might bring us back to himself. Uh, in a very short paragraph, we see very dense theological ideas being expressed to a relatively ordinary congregation. Uh, and he describes the name of the feast 
It is theophany because he has appeared. The appearance of God, theophany. And it is nativity because it is the natus or the birth uh, of, of Christ. Uh, we should not be afraid, it seems to me, to express theological ideas in our sermons uh, and in our teaching at all levels, as if it was beyond those whom we serve. Rather, at the appropriate level and in the appropriate way, it is necessary for us to build a firm foundation uh, of thinking and understanding in the lives of each one uh, who hears us. Uh, in 38, he says, this is our festival. This is the feast we celebrate today in which God comes to live with human beings that we may journey towards God. This is a very rich theological idea. Uh, it, it says no, no more than he said uh, in the other passage about uh, God having taken our humanity that we might become uh, like gods in a way. Uh, but here he is very clear. He's not talking only about shepherds and sheep uh, and baby Jesus in the manger. But God has come to live with human beings so that human beings may journey towards God or return uh, to be with God. Because that is how God created us in the being, in the beginning. Uh, as in Adam we have died, so we may live in Christ. Born with Christ crucified with him, buried with him, and rising with him. Uh, and here in even this one sentence, we again see these ideas of amnesis and mimesis. Uh, all of these aspects of, of the life and ministry of Christ, his birth, his crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection, uh, we are asked not to merely think about them, but to experience them. Uh, how is it that I may die myself in Christ? How is it that I may be born with Christ? How may I be crucified with Christ? How may I be buried with him? How may I rise with him? Uh, these are the questions that St. Gregory asks of his congregations. How do we participate in these events, which are live to us, present to us? Uh, not merely a matter of thinking back 2,000 years, but understanding how we enter into them ourselves. Uh, and how do we do these so that we become like Christ? Uh, so that in Adam we have died, uh, our likeness to Adam is, is to be uh, buried and forgotten. And our new likeness is to be with Christ. How is this to come about? These are the questions that St. Gregory wants to ask his congregations. This is his ambition that we may participate in these events as we read them and as we celebrate them uh, and that in participating in them we become like the one uh, whom they are about. We become like Christ. It is not enough to read about his burial. We must experience that burial ourselves to become like him in burial. It is not enough for us to say that we have been raised from death uh, through the sacrament of baptism for instance. We must experience this rising from death ourselves, not only in ourselves, but uh, as becoming like Christ, who is a man raised from death. Uh, always there are these two aspects, anamnesis, participating in that which has taken place as it is encountered now, and mimesis, how does our experience allow us to become like Christ, or like those others of whom we read. Uh, again from Oration 38 on the Nativity. Uh, and here we can see that he is dealing with a time of theological controversy and he is not afraid to introduce theology into his sermons. Uh, it is necessary for the shepherding and the preservation of his flock that he speaks clearly about the orthodox dogma. Uh, and so when he's speaking about God, because he is in a time where there is confusion about what God means, he says this. When I say God, I mean Father and Son and Holy Spirit. The divinity is not diffused beyond these, lest we introduce a crowd of gods, but nor is it limited to fewer than these, lest we become condemned to a poverty of divinity, either Judaizing because of the monarchy or Hellenizing because of the abundance. For the evil is alike in both cases, though it is found in opposites. 
But now there were those who, when they heard St. Gregory speak about God, might have imagined only one God, and that the word of God was like God, but not God at all. And the Holy Spirit was perhaps some created influence, created by the word, who was created by God the Father. It was necessary for him to explain to his congregation what he meant and what orthodoxy teaches. But there might have been others there brought up in a pagan household and background who imagined that the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit were the three Christian gods, but uh, there was a place for many other gods. There was a place for the gods of Greece and a place for the gods of Persia. And so he wants to be very clear and he defines his terms. Uh, and this seems important to me in our own service, that we are very clear about what we mean. There are many words which have some controversy attached to them in our present times, even within our own Coptic Orthodox Church, but more widely as well. We need to be very clear what we mean and express what we mean very clearly, so that we do not confuse ourselves and do not allow others to be confused. Uh, and so here he is expressing the idea, when I say God, I mean Father, Son and Holy Spirit. I don't mean one God like the Jews, because they have a poverty of divinity, he says. And I don't mean that these are just three among tens and hundreds of gods, uh, as the Greeks, uh, who are uh, dealing with an abundance of divinity, he can say. Because both of these are wrong. Both of these are evil and harmful and dangerous to us. It is necessary for us, even when uh, we are preaching on the Feast of the Nativity, to insist that the God of whom we are speaking uh, is the consubstantial Holy Trinity of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Uh, and so again here we see from the fathers that we should not be afraid even in our preaching to the congregations uh, and to various groups within the church to express a strict and dogmatic orthodoxy so that they are able to develop not only moral insight, not only spiritual insight, but dogmatic and theological insight uh, for their necessary growth. And he continues in this theological vein within this homily. It was the word of God himself, the one who is before the ages. He approaches his own image and bears flesh because of my flesh and mingles himself with a rational soul because of my soul, purifying like by like. And in all things he becomes a human being except sin. God with what he has assumed, one from two opposites, flesh and spirit, the one deifying and the other deified. He is made poor in my flesh that I might be enriched through his divinity. And so here we see that in his theological reflection, and he is St. Gregory the theologian, uh, when he is speaking about the nativity, he doesn't want us to remain on the outside of shepherds and, and lambs uh, and a manger and a baby. He wants us to understand the reality of what is happening here. Uh, not only are we dealing with God, the Holy Trinity, or Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but this word of God himself has become a man exactly like us except sin. Uh, there is no aspect of his being which is deficient, uh, nothing which is natural to our humanity, because sin is not natural to us. Uh, and so we see and insist as Oriental Orthodox Christians uh, who venerate the memory and the teaching of St. Gregory of Nazianzus, the theologian, that the word of God who has become Jesus Christ is lacking no aspect of our humanity at all. Uh, found within his humanity is the faculty of will, for instance, which is sometimes disputed. Uh, found within him is a human soul and a human mind uh, and all of the human appetites brought under control uh, according to his perfection and holiness. But there is nothing lacking in his humanity. Uh, and in, a, in the Feast of the Nativity and in his preaching on the Nativity, uh, this is what it is necessary for St. Gregory and for us to insist on the theological meaning of the Feast, uh, as much as the moral and spiritual encouragement and insight. Uh, and then following through the liturgical year, 
Uh, in Oration 39, we think of baptism. Uh, and this is especially uh, a reflection and a homily on the baptism of Christ. Uh, and he says, The holy day of lights to which we have come and which we are deemed worthy to celebrate today takes its origin from the baptism of my Christ, the true light, which illumines every human being coming into the world, effects my purification and strengthens the light we receive from him from the beginning, which we darkened and blotted out through sin. Uh, what do we see here? He calls it the holy day of lights. Uh, and of course, baptism is illumination. Uh, and in many cultures, candles are, are uh, properly used as a symbol of illumination. Uh, and even in my own experience, where I have baptized some infants from other Orthodox communities, uh, their families have come bearing candles uh, to celebrate a holy day of light, as St. Gregory calls it. Uh, and it is illumination. Um, we sometimes forget in our Orthodox understanding, because baptism happens uh, most often in our experience with an infant, that baptism is understood as an enlightenment, uh, that it is an opening of the eyes, that it is seeing light in the darkness. Uh, and for someone who has become Orthodox uh, as an adult, this can be their personal experience. But in terms of anamnesis, this must be our own experience. As we commemorate in our feasts the baptism of Christ, as we commemorate in our feasts the illumination which Christ has become, the light in the world, we must ask ourselves, how am I participating in this light? How do I encounter this light afresh as I celebrate the feast of the baptism of our Lord, which is... Uh, celebrated now by us uh, after the Feast of Nativity. Uh, it is not enough for us to be uh, morally and spiritually encouraged and moved as we read the scriptures. As we celebrate the feast, we are encouraged to enter into the meaning and the reality of the event of the baptism of Christ ourselves. Uh, to be with Christ as he goes into the water. To hear the Father say to us, uh, my beloved child and to find that the Holy Spirit comes upon us as we participate spiritually and truly uh, in the event of the baptism of the Lord Jesus made man for our salvation uh, and this is what anamnesis is as we remind ourselves it is our own personal participation in this timeless event uh, as we encounter Christ in it coming to him with prayer and praise and thanksgiving uh, but finding that today is for us the holy day of lights uh, the day in which the light of the world manifests himself uh, for us this is anamnesis that it becomes real for me and is not just a matter of of study and intellect and thought uh, and then also in oration 39 we read this he he, he spends many pages comparing baptism as a Christian sacrament with the various rites of cleansing and illumination uh, and initiation which are found uh, in the pagan religions. And, and here he says this, and he's speaking of baptism, of course. Is it some kind of legal and shadowy purification, providing aid through temporary sprinklings and sprinkling the ashes of a heifer on those who have become unclean? Here he's speaking about the Jewish tradition in the law is it something like what the greeks reveal in their initiations to me all their initiations and mysteries are a nonsense dark inventions of demons and fabrications of a demon possessed mind assisted by time and deceived by myth our experience of baptism isn't like this nor is our celebration and participation in the meaning of baptism on the feast of uh, the baptism of our Lord. Neither is that a celebration uh, of a merely human or religious or psychological process of cleansing. Something else is going on, uh, something which has a timeless and cosmic quality about it. Uh, and so we are able to participate in it. Even as we celebrate the feast, we renew our participation in our own baptism. 
we renew our participation in our own baptism because it is the baptism of Christ. Uh, we are never baptized uh, as though a washing in water in itself achieves anything. We are baptized because these waters are already sanctified by the baptism of God made man for our salvation. Always in the Christian understanding, we are participating in the life of Christ. Uh, and as we celebrate the feasts, this becomes especially manifest. And so St. Gregory is able to look to the Jewish legal practice uh, and ask, what is there in this? Uh, it isn't connected in the same way uh, to the events of the life of Christ, who is God himself. And what do the Greeks do with their, with their psychological games and, 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 and mysticism? Uh, their smoke and mirrors held in caves and underground cellars as much of the mystery religions did. Um, what has this got to do with the cosmic and timeless quality of the baptism of, of Christ which affects our own baptism? And this is what he says when he finishes after many pages condemning all these different sorts of baptism or initiation. When I speak of God, be struck from all sides by the lightning flash of one light and also three. Three in regard to the individualities, that is hypostases, if one prefers to call them this, or persons. For we will not struggle with our comrades about the names as long as the syllables convey the same idea. But if one speaks of the essence, that is the divinity, for they are divided undividedly, and united in division for the divinity is one in three and the three are one in whom the divinity is or to speak more precisely who are the divinity this is why saint gregory is called the theologian because he is able to speak about god he is able uh, in that uh, special sense uh, to give us theological insight but this is his understanding of what the illumination of baptism reveals. Uh, and this is why much of the teaching which was given to catechumens in the church was given after their baptism and not before. Uh, this idea that it is by illumination, by enlightenment from God himself, that we suddenly understand the one in the three and the three in the one. Uh, and this is why our participation in baptism uh, has this sense of being an encounter with God. And the encounter with God is always the encounter with God as Trinity. Uh, and for the one who has not been baptized, he, he may perhaps have a, an intellectual appreciation of this. Uh, but as far as St. Gregory of, of, of Nazianzus is concerned, it is in the actual participation in baptism and then again and again in our participation in baptism on the feast of the baptism of our Lord, uh, that we gain this renewed insight over and over again, um, enlightening the darkness of our mind and heart, uh, that the light is the light of the Holy Trinity who is present to us. Not a subject who is far away from us that we talk about uh, at a distance, but this reality we have encountered of three divine persons who are one divinity. Uh, and it is only the person who has encountered this holy trinity of persons in one divinity who can do theology. Uh, and that is why Gregory of Nazianzus is especially the theologian. He has encountered the holy trinity uh, as one divinity. And therefore he can write uh, in this way that he does about it. And he invites us on the feast of the baptism to enter into this experience. And we remember when we read the scriptures about the baptism that uh, the son is baptized, the father speaks and the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove. And it is a Trinitarian um, event. And therefore, as we reflect on the baptism and more than that, as we participate again in it, we discover the Holy Trinity present to us. And this is why, um, not just because he wants to introduce some theology, this is why St. Gregory speaks of the lightning flash of one light and also three. 
because he's speaking about illumination in this feast and the great illumination which we experience is that encounter with God as the Holy Trinity uh, and then he speaks on and throughout his homily he's using this idea of light and illumination Christ is illumined let us flash like lightning with him okay now we see still anamnesis but now mimesis so we are entering into this experience of uh, the baptism of Christ what does it mean to us uh, it means that we must become like him Christ is baptized let us go down with him that we may also come up again with him Jesus is baptized is this all and we can ask that of ourselves is this all we're saying are we just giving a list of things that happen in the Bible uh, or are we actually entering into by participation these things about which we speak uh, who is he we can't enter into the meaning of the baptism unless we have reflected on who Jesus Christ is who is being baptized by whom is he baptized and when he is the pure one and he is being baptized by John at the beginning of his signs what are we to learn and what are we to be taught by this it has to make a difference our celebration of the feasts is never just a mental exercise in looking back it's always a personal encounter now and if it is a personal encounter now then we have to ask what difference does it make what are we to learn what are we to be taught uh, and here especially he goes off into a, a section in his homily thinking about different things but he begins to purify ourselves beforehand to purify ourselves beforehand uh, and so this is not just something that we might say to someone who is going to be baptized you need to purify yourself uh, but this is how we are to approach the feasts uh, and again not as though the feasts are times when we look back and think about how we ought to change our lives these are moments when we again connect and participate in the baptism of Christ himself therefore how are we to participate ourselves in the baptism of Christ it is only by purifying ourselves beforehand uh, how can we participate in the nativity and be present in the nativity only by purifying ourselves beforehand how we can can we participate in the holy pascha only by purifying ourselves beforehand not so that we can feel satisfied when we stand in the liturgies of the feasts that we've done a good job but it is only by purification of ourselves by the grace of the holy spirit that we can truly encounter god in these cosmic and timeless moments uh, when we don't go back to the past but we step out of the present into that time of now which belongs to God uh, because in the divine sense God is always being born he, it is always now with God he is always being baptized he is always being crucified he is always being buried he is always being raised from the dead uh, and so it is for us to step outside of the now into the always with God with the word with Christ who is made man for us uh, so that we go beyond looking backwards uh, and we enter into a present participation uh, and then also in this oration 39 he says Jesus comes up again out of the water for he carries up with himself the world and sees the heavens opened which Adam closed for himself and for those after him as he closed paradise by the flaming sword and the spirit testifies to Christ's divinity for he ran towards one like himself as does the voice from heaven for from there comes the one to whom testimony is given uh, here again we see that the celebration of the feast uh, is, is not about merely a remembrance of what we read in the scriptures but rather it is an understanding that something cosmic and timeless has taken place uh, when Christ comes up out of the water it is not merely a man coming up dripping from the river Jordan 
Uh, rather, when Christ comes out of the water, he is bringing all of mankind and even creation with him. Because all of the old Adam has been buried in the waters. All of the old Adam uh, has been left there in the flood of the river Jordan. And he rises renewed as man, as creation. Uh, and this wonderful idea uh, that heaven was opened. We read in, 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 in the account that the heavens were opened. Uh, and this is what is meant, according to St. Gregory of Nazianzus. Heaven, the way to heaven, is made open because of the baptism of Christ. And when we only think in a nostalgic way, in a historical way, then we try to imagine what was that like? What did the people see? Did they see the clouds open? Uh, rather, St. Gregory is asking us, what does it mean if we participate in the baptism of Christ with Christ so that the way to heaven is made open for us? What does it mean for us now? On the day of the feast especially, but every day, what does it mean now? That the heavens are opened and we have access to God as we participate in the baptism of Christ. Not as we read about the baptism of Christ. Not as we think about how we ought to live since we've been baptized. But as we actually participate, take part, go into the waters with Christ, come out of the waters with Christ, see the heavens opened with Christ. This is what St. Gregory wants us to understand of the feasts. Uh, and of the entire Christian life, that it is one of participating in the life of Christ with Christ now in our own experience, so that that which belongs to Christ can belong to us because we experience and are filled with his own divine life, even as he gave himself to become man like us. Then he says, Moses baptized but in water, and before this in the cloud and in the sea. But this was typological, as Paul also thinks. The sea was a type of the water, the cloud of the spirit, the manna of the bread of life, the drink of the divine drink. So he looks back to the Old Testament and he sees all of these types. Uh, and as we reflect on these types, they, they draw us to the reality that we now experience. John also baptized, he says, yet no longer in a Jewish way, for he did so not only in water, but for repentance. And this was new. This was different. He wasn't uh, baptizing only for ritual purity, but for a change of heart. Repentance is metanoia, a change of thinking. But he was not yet baptizing in a holy spiritual way. For he did not add the words in the spirit. Jesus also baptized, but in the spirit. And this is perfection. And so what can we say? We can say that uh, with anamnesis, we look back to Moses and we look back to these encounters that are typological expressions of what will happen through the ministry of Christ. Uh, and we are not to recall them merely as answers to uh, Sunday school quizzes, but we are to understand that the reality is that which we are called to participate in. Uh, it is of little value for us to imagine and reflect on the children of Israel passing through the waters of the Red Sea. If we do not apply that to ourselves and think about what it means in our own personal experience as we participate also in going through the waters of the sea with Christ, who brings us out of Egypt, as we thought in another oration, uh, and sets us on the journey of Exodus, where we can worship God freely. Uh, we have the perfection in Christ, uh, St. Gregory Nazianzus tells us. Uh, we see a typology in Moses. Uh, we see uh, the beginning of something new in John, and we see the perfection in Christ. Uh, and yet, St. Gregory is always wanting us to go beyond merely having an intellectual uh, appreciation of these things even for us to say Jesus baptized in the spirit and this is perfection uh, falls short of perfection if we do not encounter this reality ourselves and we encounter this reality especially on the feast days uh, and especially as 
we make our own experience this going into the waters of baptism with Christ and we seek to understand not with an intellectual uh, appreciation what that means but with a spiritual uh, experience and participation so that we can truly say I was baptized with Christ this is what the feast recalls us to uh, am I baptized with Christ what would it mean for me to be baptized with Christ how far have I fallen short of this experience of participating in the baptism of Christ uh, and we can see that baptism is important to him because he has another oration yet a third on baptism uh, and this passage is is helpful and interesting to us the word of scripture recognizes three births for us one from the body one from baptism and one from resurrection the first takes place at night and in slavery and in passions the second takes place in the day and in freedom and releases from passions leading us back towards the life on high the third is more fearful and more swift assembling in a moment all that has been created and presenting it to the creator to give an account of its servitude and way of life here so what are these three births there's our own natural birth from the body there is our second birth from baptism and there is our third birth which is yet to come in the resurrection uh, and it's interesting that uh, for saint gregory the first takes place he says at night and in slavery and in passions uh, it is associated with our humanity in uh, its brokenness that we are born the second takes place in the light uh, and we've already been considering the idea of baptism as illumination it brings light into our lives and freedom and release from passions uh, and there is a sense that because so many of the members of our church are baptized as infants uh, we don't teach over and over again what the meaning of baptism is and this seems uh, especially important today in our contemporary society with uh, so many challenges and temptations around us uh, we have to restore this sense of what baptism is and it may be the case that baptism was experienced and received uh, 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 years before when we were an infant but this is its meaning uh, freedom and a release from passions uh, and we have to restore the practice and participation and experience of this aspect of baptism it's not just the means by which we became part of a particular cultural group uh, the coptic orthodox church or orthodoxy in general uh, it's not the way we became a member it's not just uh, the, the thing you do with a baby uh, it is truly the means by which we gain freedom and release from passion uh, and so it is necessary for us uh, not so much to teach the reality and necessity of baptism but to teach its meaning uh, and as saint gregory has been speaking how we are to participate and experience this idea of being baptized with christ in our daily lives especially at the feasts where this focus is renewed but in our daily lives what does it mean for me to have this second birth how can i experience its power more and more uh, as i seek to encounter christ more and more deeply uh, and completely and then the third birth is our resurrection uh, and saint gregory presents it as something fearful uh, something unexpected and swift where we will have to give an account of how we have lived our lives what use have we made of the baptism god has given us uh, have we become illuminated or have we allowed the candle of our baptism to burn low uh, or to be extinguished uh, and so this gives us a sense that in baptism uh, there there is a beginning a before in our natural birth where we are separated from god where we are in darkness and confusion uh, and god gives us this gift of baptism which is a participation in the baptism of christ uh, and then there will be a third birth where we have to give an account for what we have done with this great talent this treasure uh, beyond price which is the new life in christ but we only grow into this new life in our own experience 
by encountering Christ and participating in the life of Christ. Not by learning more about what Christ did, but making that our own experience as well in the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then again on baptism in oration 40. Since we are twofold, composed of soul and body, and our nature is visible yet also invisible, the purification is also twofold, through water, I say, and spirit. The one is received in a way that can be seen and is bodily, and the other joins with it incorporeally and in a way that cannot be seen. And the one is symbolic, while the other is true and purifies the depths. And the power of baptism is to be understood as a covenant with God for a second life and a purer lifestyle. And this is our experience as Orthodox Christians of baptism. Uh, God gives himself to us in this dual way, uh, both physically and spiritually, because we are also uh, visible yet invisible in our duality. Uh, our body and soul are visible and invisible. Uh, and so in the Holy Eucharist, Christ comes to us in bread and wine, which become his body and blood. He comes to us uh, visibly and invisibly to uh, transform our body uh, and to fill our heart uh, and to enlighten our spirit. Uh, and here in baptism, it's the same, according to St. Gregory of Nazianzus. Uh, and we understand this. Here is the water. It is water. Uh, we have poured oil on it, which visibly is oil. Uh, we have prayed words over it, which are words. Uh, on the one hand, everything is, is physical, we can say. And it bears a symbolic uh, meaning and value. Uh, and we understand that water represents uh, both a burial uh, and a washing and a cleansing. Yet that which cannot be seen is that which is most important and fills the physical and the symbolic with uh, a reality. A truthfulness and so the power of baptism is not uh, a physical washing it's not a, a thinking about God it is an encounter with God in the waters in the depths that purifies our outer man as we can say uh, and the inner man the heart um, but it is for a purpose again everything that St Gregory preaches uh, is intended to have a purpose and an outcome in the life of those who hear him. Uh, and so we celebrate the feast of baptism. We seek to participate in the baptism of Christ. We recall our own baptism. Uh, but it must be for an outcome. And what is this outcome? It is, as he has just said, that we experience and participate fruitfully in this second birth. And this second birth is one which is, uh, he represents it here, a purer lifestyle, a lifestyle of purity. And purity doesn't mean simply avoiding uh, sexual temptation. Purity means that there is nothing within our heart that does not belong. That everything within our heart that is other than God, other than godliness, has been removed. Uh, the envy, the jealousy, the anger, the bitterness, uh, the, the desire for self-importance, all of these things, as well as lustful thoughts and gluttony. Uh, these are all impurities. Uh, and it is these that we covenant, we promise God, we enter into a relationship with God, that he will give us this new birth and we will make every effort to use this new birth to enter into relationship with him. Uh, and so this is why it is both physical uh, uh, and spiritual, visible and invisible. The visible is always the guarantee and the sign in our Christian faith of that which is received invisibly and spiritually. Uh, and so in the baptism of an infant, uh, we do not gather and imagine that God has received this child, but we plunge the child into the water. Uh, so that they might participate in the baptism of Christ. Uh, and this is where we must teach as the child comes out of the water and grows into a youth uh, and a young adult and an adult. 
This is where we must teach the meaning of this baptism. Uh, that it is a lifelong experience of this second birth. Uh, a lifelong return to uh, the experience of being plunged into the waters with Christ. This is why we have the feasts through the year. So that again and again and again we return uh, to the beginnings of our life. Uh, we return to the beginnings of faith. We return to that first gift which is found in the life and ministry of Christ. Uh, and this is why uh, for ourselves in the celebration of the feasts we are not thinking only with the head. We are not thinking nostalgically. We are not recreating in a dramatic way that will move our emotions. But we are seeking to experience the reality of each of these things which we encounter on the feasts. Uh, and then let, let me summarise. And he says it here in his oration number 40 on baptism. To summarise, there is no way of life or occupation in which baptism is not advantageous. You who are in authority, accept it as a bridle. You who are in slavery, as equality of honour. You who are discouraged, as encouragement. You who are cheerful, as training. You who are poor, as wealth that cannot be stolen. You who are affluent, as good management of what you possess. Do not play subtle tricks or connive cunningly against your own salvation. What does he mean? Uh, this comes at the end of a, a long section where he is addressing all of those people. And, and there are unfortunately many people in many different categories that he addresses who were putting off their baptism at the time he wrote. And they had various reasons for wanting to wait uh, in their baptism. Uh, some of them were a fear that they might fall into sin. Uh, others were uh, the sense that they were too busy getting on with their lives uh, and it wasn't time for them to settle down into a life of virtue. Um, but there were other things. There were, there were those he criticises who wanted to wait until a bishop came <coughs> to baptise their child. Or not just a bishop, but a metropolitan. And they were putting off baptism for various reasons. Uh, and so in summary of, of this homily, he wants them to understand that baptism is necessary in every condition of life. Baptism is not uh, a, a ritual or a rite that we perform simply for children or older people uh, to show that they're part of our community. But it has a personal uh, experiential value uh, it is something in which we participate in uh, and whatever our situation we will find ourselves strengthened and encouraged and helped uh, by participating in baptism and we can say as those who have been baptized in the Coptic Orthodox Church or, or in any church any of the orthodox churches we can say that we must apply this to ourselves by saying that the remembrance the participation again in our baptism has value for all uh, characters and quality of men for every situation of life uh, we should not allow our baptism to be forgotten as if it was something that had to happen when we were an infant uh, and now it's been done we can perhaps tick it off some list it is necessary for us, just as it was necessary for these whom St. Gregory addresses, to honestly face up to the need for baptism. It is necessary for each of us to honestly, especially at the feasts, especially at the feast of the baptism of our Lord, to face up again to asking, what does baptism mean? How do I encounter baptism? How do I participate in the baptism of Christ again in my life? How do I plunge myself in, self into the water again with him and find myself raised again to new life with him? How is it that I can find the heavens opened for me also in my complicated and difficult and anxiety-filled life perhaps? Uh, and so baptism for each of us uh, and the feasts for each of us are opportunities to refocus our lives not in a mental way but experientially and by participation. To reconnect ourselves, not with the ideas and the narrative of Christ, but with the person of Christ in these experiences. Uh, this is what it means to be a Christian. 
this is what it means to uh, have the life of Christ within us. Not that we are trying to copy someone who is separate and other from us, but so that we are trying to experience and live out this divine life which has been given to us by Christ in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then in our last slide, on Oration 40, as he comes to the end, uh, he, he's speaking about the feasts, and this is what uh, someone has said to him uh, about why they are putting off baptism. I am waiting for Theophany, someone says. Uh, Pascha would be more valuable for me. I will wait for Pentecost. Uh, it is better to be illumined with Christ or to rise with Christ on the day of resurrection or to honour the manifestation of the Spirit. Then what? The end will come suddenly on a day that you do not expect and at an hour that you do not know. It's interesting here that we can see some of the feasts uh, that were known to St Gregory at his time. Theophany, Pascha, Pentecost. Uh, and we can see that people are baptised at these different feasts. As we know, it was customary for baptism to take place uh, at the great feasts. But when we keep putting things off, and in the context of these festal orations, uh, we can say that we are offered the opportunity of participating again through encountering Christ in the reality of these events. When we keep putting off our participation in the reality of these events, we can say with St. Gregory, then what? Uh, when will you decide that you need to plug yourself back into this life of Christ? The end will come suddenly on a day that you do not expect. And you have been putting it off over and over again, day by day, month by month, year by year. It is in the feasts, especially that the church has ordered the year so that we have the possibility of encountering Christ not as a person apart from these events but as Christ in these events and so on the feast days especially and this is why we prepare for so many by by fasting uh, by giving ourselves to purification and prayer it is in the fasts that we encounter God the word being born into the world uh, even in, in, in those times around the nativity we stand with Christ at that circumcision and we can ask what does the circumcision mean spiritually for me as I participate in it uh, Christ with Simeon and Anna what does it mean to be with Christ at that moment what does it mean for me to be with Christ uh, at the visit of the Magi what does it mean for me to be with Christ and in Christ in his baptism? To be with Christ and in Christ in the temptation in the wilderness. To be with Christ and in Christ uh, as he is crucified. To be with Christ and in Christ in his burial. And to be raised in Christ and with Christ in the resurrection. Thanks to God, the church from the earliest times has given us this sanctification of the year so that were we to follow the year uh, carefully and with spiritual observance we would find ourselves often drawing closer to Christ experiencing for ourselves by participation these different events not as if they happened many years ago but as we are entering into them now uh, and for Gregory this was his uh, entire purpose through this series of uh, homilies and orations uh, which he gave and which have been recorded for us on the feasts that his congregation might participate in the reality of these events and in participating in them giving themselves to Christ in them uh, they might become through mimesis like Christ uh, not as though he was an example far from them but as though his very life was in them and coming to birth and coming to life in them and through them. Uh, these are wonderful orations and, and well worth a detailed study, uh, each one of them. Uh, in them we see this, this use of theology. Uh, in them we find dogma. In them we find moral and spiritual encouragement. Uh, and constantly we find in them this sense of participating in the life of Christ 
that we might become like Christ. Uh, and it is through this, through this wonderful message uh, that these homilies have been valued and honoured and respected over the centuries, uh, preached in countless churches uh, in different places as the very highest and best uh, and most rhetorically skilled and skillful of expressions of our Christian faith. Uh, may they become an inspiration for us in our own times and our own lives as we seek to enter into the meaning of the feasts of the church through participation in Christ, to whom be all the glory now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen.